Hey again, I'm Jeff Deriso, and welcome to another edition of Mind Hack. Today, the military is using human brain waves to teach robots how to shoot. DARPA wants to hack the human brain to let us upload skills. And could observing your brain activity be the future of treating depression? We need your help to continue creating independent, people-funded media, so please support us on Kickstarter and become a member of the NewsBud community. The first article I want to look at today was published in Defense One on May 5th, 2017 by Patrick Tucker. The title says, The military is using human brain waves to teach robots how to shoot. The article begins by stating that while modern sensors can see further and react faster than humans can, humans still outperform robots in knowing what to shoot at. But, the author says, that gap may soon be closing. The author explains that because machine learning systems rely on structured data, this makes it difficult for them to accurately assess targets in chaotic environments the way humans can because our brains categorize information in the form of experiential memories. This past March, at the Intelligent User Interface Conference in Cyprus, researchers from DCS Corporation and the Army Research Lab presented their findings from a study that fed datasets of human brain waves into a neural network, which then learned to recognize when a human is making a targeting decision. This research is one branch in a long-term multifaceted program called the Cognition and Neuroergonomics Collaborative Technology Alliance, or CAN-CTA. Thomas Russell, the chief scientist for the Army, speaking at a recent National Defense Industrial Association event, spoke of how the project seeks to use a similar deep learning approach that Google's DeepMind used to defeat the world's best Go player but the Army wants to use it to solve a much more complex problem. Russell says, You can train the system to do deep learning in a highly structured environment, but if the Go game board changed dynamically over time, the AI would never be able to solve that problem. You have to figure out, in that dynamic environment we have in the military world, how do we retrain this learning process from a system's perspective? Right now, I don't think there's any way to do that without having the humans train those systems. One of the authors of the study discussed in this article, Matthew Joswa, says that the work builds on the knowledge of something called P300 responses. P300 responses are bursts of electrical activity that the parietal lobe of the brain emits in response to stimuli, which humans use to produce quick decisions. The eventual goal of the technology, according to Jaswa, is to create a neural network that can learn to shoot more accurately by observing highly trained human soldiers doing their jobs. Here's a great example of how American tax dollars are being spent. While applying human brain data to neural networks is an idea which could have positive applications, this specific application can only result in the continued killing of more human beings. I've commented on a previous episode of MindHack that there seems to be a pattern where cutting-edge technology is always first applied to warfare, and then eventually, sometimes decades later, it becomes available to the public to use for more humane applications. Our next article for today was published in Futurism on May 2, 2017, by Carla Lant. The title says, DARPA is planning to hack the human brain to let us upload skills. The article begins by explaining that DARPA's Targeted Neuroplasticity Training Program, or TNT, which was announced in March 2016, is exploring ways to speed up skill acquisition by activating something called synaptic plasticity. The article defines synaptic plasticity as the brain's ability to alter the connecting points between neurons, which is a requirement for learning. This conceptual graphic from DARPA shows how they envisioned the device could work. This device would aim to create an improved method of neurostimulation, with the eventual goal of allowing humans to, quote, download knowledge after putting our minds in a highly receptive neuroplastic state. As the first step in this TNT program, 
DARPA is funding eight projects at seven institutions, which will aim to better understand how nerve stimulation influences brain plasticity. Then, they'll adapt what they've learned by implementing different methods of neurostimulation into the training process, and then compare and contrast the efficacies of the different methods. This reminded me of something that we discussed on a previous episode of MindHack, a transcranial direct current stimulation headset produced by a company called Halo Neuroscience, used to train Navy SEALs. This was part of an effort by the Defense Innovation Unit Experimental or DIUX. The DIUX is not officially related to DARPA, though the two seem to share a very similar purpose, especially when considering the similarities between this story and the previous one about Navy SEAL training. So one of the areas I want to research more into is what are the differences and similarities between DIUX and DARPA, and how do they interact? Also, unlike the previous story we covered today, this technology is not focused on techniques of killing, but instead on improving the efficiency of the human brain. This technology could have many positive applications. Just imagine being able to learn how to speak a new language or to play a new musical composition with only the click of a button. On the other hand, my prediction is that certain skills will be much easier to learn through this downloading process than others. Specifically, I would guess that skills involving muscle memory or the memorization of data would be easy to pick up using this method. Though I would imagine more nuanced and complex skills like critical thinking, persuasion, mindfulness, or philosophy would be impossible to learn in this way. These skills rely on our uniquely human traits and cannot be reduced to data sets which can be fed through a machine. My intuition tells me that there are certain skills which can only be learned through experience. But I'll still hold out hope for being able to download the ability to do Kung Fu. We've covered many examples on this show of the military and the defense industry being very public about technologies that they're working on. But that leaves me to wonder whether there are technologies that they are being less public about. And that is the subject of today's Mind Hack Flashback. Today, we flash back to December 12th, 2002, when a patent for nervous system manipulation by electromagnetic fields from monitors was awarded to a mysterious inventor by the name of Hendricus G. Luce. The patent claims to make it possible to manipulate the nervous system of a subject by pulsing images displayed on a nearby computer monitor or TV set. The patent says, the image pulsing may be embedded in the program material, or it may be overlaid by modulating a video stream. Unfortunately, there is very little available information about the supposed inventor, Hendricus G. Luce, who holds 14 other patents for similar technology, dating back to the 1980s. My research uncovered documents that indicate that Mr. Luce, who is currently 91 years old, started a company called Laguna Research Lab in his home in Fallbrook, California in the 1980s. Laguna Research Lab won several contracts from DARPA as well as the Army and the Navy. Other online records indicate that Hendricus G. Luce, who also goes by Hank, is the principal operator of Q-Wave Corporation, founded in 2005. Q-Wave Corporation is registered at the exact same address in Fallbrook, California, where Laguna Research Lab was located. There are many online researchers who speculate that this technology is used for covert government mind control operations. And these rumors are only fueled by a lack of publicly available information about Mr. Hendricus G. Luce and his company, Q-Wave Corporation. When I tried to reach out to Q-Wave Corporation by phone to get to the facts behind the rumors, I received a recorded message that the number had been disconnected. We're sorry. The patent record for Mr. Luce's 2002 invention shows that he resided at 3019 Cresta Way in Laguna Beach, California. When I tried reaching Mr. Luce at a personal phone number tied to this address, I received the same recorded message that the number had been disconnected. Some other internet researchers have speculated that 
Hendricus G. Luce is actually a pseudonym used to disguise the real patent holders. That may be true, but this house in Laguna Beach is registered under the name Hendricus G. Luce. And also another person named John J. Luce, who I assume is the wife of Hank Luce. If there's anyone out there in the Laguna Beach area who knows something about this address, 3019 Crest Away, or has any insight into who this person is, please leave a comment on this video so we can better understand who this mysterious inventor is. However, I would ask that anyone out there investigating further into this topic, please respect the privacy of the current residents of this house. Here we have an example of an inventor with a traceable documented record of working with DARPA and the military who is working on a technology that is not being highly publicized. In fact, it's hard to track down any information on who this person is and what exactly this patent is being used for. And that is today's Mind Hack Flashback. Our final article for today was published in Business Insider on May 4th, 2017 by Aaron Broadwin. The title says, a strange technique that involves observing your own brain activity could be the future of treating depression. According to a recently published study by Kimberly Young of the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, a technique called fMRI neurofeedback can help people who suffer from depression. Young says that her experiment, which involves having a person observe the activity of their own amygdala and consciously try to increase that activity by recalling positive memories, has shown promising results. The study was conducted on 36 adult volunteers. After two sessions, 63% of the neurofeedback participants reported a, quote, significant decrease in a standard rating scale of depression versus only 12% in the placebo control group. Young says the treatment is effective because the amygdala is known to play a role in depression. Her goal is to train the amygdala in depressed people to be more responsive to positive emotional cues. Kimberly Young warns that fMRI neurofeedback should not be equated with EEG neurofeedback which uses an electroencephalogram headset similar to the emotive device we discussed in episode one of MindHack. Young makes the analogy that if fMRI is a Google Maps for the brain, then EEG is a rough, hand-drawn street map. So as a result, she says, quote, we can get at deep brain structures such as the amygdala that EEG neurofeedback simply can't get to. The article then continues with a few more snarky comments from Young about why her fMRI technique is way cooler than that lame EEG neurofeedback technique. She continues, Not many people are doing any controlled studies of EEG neurofeedback, so it's likely that what they're seeing is just a placebo response. So I'm not really sure what point Young is trying to make by saying this other than trying to reinforce that her research as legitimate whereas EEG neurofeedback is not. In a way, it's just her trying to one-up her competition. And to me, the main point is this. Whether you use an EEG or an fMRI, is the use of a high-tech device really required to cure depression? Doesn't it stand to reason that if a so-called mental disorder like depression is brought about by emotions, that facing and conquering these emotions would be the only proper way to cure it? Perhaps neurofeedback can be helpful in understanding these emotions, but who is going to be able to afford these scans? The fMRI equipment itself costs between half a million and three million dollars. So I'm guessing that people like me wouldn't be able to afford this type of treatment. Wouldn't it be just as helpful and much more cost effective for someone suffering from depression to simply talk to a licensed therapist who can listen to them in an environment free from judgment? Can high-tech gadgetry really solve all of our human emotional problems? Human emotions can only be understood by other humans, not by electronic devices. So when solving these emotional problems, a digital intermediary seems kind of unnecessary. That's it for this edition of MindHack. 
Thanks for watching, and please continue supporting independent media by contributing to our Kickstarter campaign and becoming a member of the NewsBud community. A factually based, people driven media can only succeed with your help. So join us. I'm Jeff DeRiso, and I'll see you next time. You our generous supporters and community members are the reason we exist. You are the power that has kept us operating and expanding towards this amazing success. And you are the sole determinant of the continuation and steady expansion of NewsBud operations. Please join us. Join the NewsBud movement by kindly and generously pledging towards this 100% people-funded media with integrity. Yes, we have accomplished a lot, but this is only the beginning and that is my promise to you.